Before I introduce Dr. Kaman, let me tell you a little bit about her. She is a long-term university professor and writer, and she often jokes that she spent her life really as a writer among scientists and a scientist among writer writers. And she does now write science fiction, which brings the two worlds together. She was born and educated in Europe, holds a PhD degree in science and a degree in medical biophysics from Europe. She has extended experience in teaching and popularizing science, which helps her present even complicated things in a manner that's easy to understand. She speaks more than 12 languages and has that's enabled her to read ancient sources in their original language and to read the web pages of um, ancient history about many nations and her knowledge of ancient texts helped her to integrate ancient wisdom and uh, to do so in a really scientific manner and i really enjoy dr kaman's work because she answers so many questions in a very very credible and scientific manner well maria welcome to the show Thank you very much for having me, Steve. Thank you, Maria. We're really excited, and I want to thank you particularly because I know you've got a cold, and you you've still made it for us. So we appreciate that. Thank you. Well, Maria, the first question I want to ask you is for you to explain to us where your work exploring the mysteries of our world began. How it began? Uh, <laughs> this is difficult to answer because uh, I have been curious girl the all my life, and I had a lot of questions in my head that were not answered. And um, when I started writing the books, I had been planning when I retired from the university to write books. But it happened so that there was budget cuts and everybody who was part-time was laid off. So I desperately looked for jobs for a while. And then I decided, okay, maybe it is time to sit down and write the books that I had been planning to write before my life. So I started writing. And this writing continued 25 years. And I had written 25 books. I cannot believe myself that I reached the number 25. If somebody would tell me, I will write 20 books, 25 books, I will say, I doubt it, the number is too big. <laughs> so I had a lot of questions in my head uh, during my lifetime. And um, I just started getting the answers. And sometimes they will be funneled in my head in the middle of writing another book. So um, I'm very thankful for this gift. And um, I spend, being a scientist, I spend a lot of time trying to find proof that other sources said the same. So. And in this way, the things that I have look really logical and uh, get some weight. Well, that's Maria. I I know that you've come up with many many answers yourself through your channeling, but you've done a huge amount of scientific research to validate them. I want to ask you if you could explain to us your understanding of the ice ages. The ice ages? Yes, the the different ice ages and Noah's flood. Yeah, <clears throat> I will tell you um, that uh, I read the book written by John and Catherine Imbri about the ice ages, the ice ages solving the mystery, and I was so impressed by this book because he has uh, periodicity of ice ages based on the research done on uh, study, uh, study of the glaciers. And uh, 
I read ancient sources that speak about periodicity of ice ages, and they give precisely what is the periodicity. And I compare with our contemporary studies of the glaciers, and the difference was 0.3%, which means the ancients knew what they were talking about. So they they knew about these periodic ice ages, and they made the connection with Noah's Ark and the flood, or you made that connection? Yeah. Um, I was able, based on study of the glaciers, to date Noah's flood. And this is the big flood that followed the big ice age. And in our study of the glaciers, the first deep meaning belongs to the Big Ice Age. And the Big, ta- big Ice Age, when the huge polar caps, ice caps, started melting, this is when uh, the North Flood took place. So there is this sort of validation between the Ice Ages and the time of Noah's Flood. Yes. And I was also able to date a local Black Sea flood that happened 2,562 years according to the periodicity of ice ages, one, one cycle after the big flood of Noah. Uh, uh, this was local Black Sea flood, and this flood was dated by Ballard, who found the wreck ship Titanic, and he retrieved uh, a piece of wood from the bottom of the sea, piece from a flooded house, and it was dated with carbon 14 as 7,000 years ago. And there is a misunderstanding that this was the Noah flood. This was not the Noah flood. This was the flood after the first mini ice age, when the ice of the first mini ice age started melting. It's fascinating, Maria. And I wanted to to ask if you could explain to us the connection, or the, explain to us through your research, the connection between Noah, and we know from what you've said that the flood did happen, we know it was associated with the periodicity of the ice ages, but what's the connection between Noah and Enoch? Mm-hmm. Enoch was the great-grandfather of, of Noah. And what might be extremely interesting, the name Noah means new. And I found ancient sources that say that when Noah was born, uh, the father, his father was very concerned that this might be not his child because it was different from the other children. And he was suspicious that his wife maybe had an affair or something. So, uh, and and she was swearing that this is not true. So he went to Enoch because Enoch knew almost everything. And asked him what this means. And Enoch said, give him the name Noah, which means new, because he will survive a big flood and he will start a new civilization, a new from the very beginning. And so, Maria, is there a connection between Enoch and the land or civilization of Atlantis? Enos, Enoch uh, was the 10th patriarch 
no, I was the bin Adriak. Uh, Enoch was the seventh. But every one of the patriarchs live more than 900 years. So, uh, starting with Adam, you pass through Enoch, and the Bible said that Enoch didn't die, he was just taken to heaven. And if you read the book of Enoch, you will see that he was in a state of clinical death, and when he came back, he was telling to his children what he has experienced, and this was the basis of many, many books that he has written. The total number uh, is 30 books. And uh, nor when he was fleeing from the flood, he took seven of the books of Enoch with himself. And do, does, did, and after, did he take after, those books from Atlantis after then? After his clinical dad, he knew so many things that are going to happen. And one of them was Noah, and the other was uh, about the Messiah called Jesus. It is in his predictions, revelations. So Enoch predicted the Great Flood. He knew about the Great Flood. And was Enoch located in Atlantis? Mm, no. This was after Atlantis sank. Noah fled from the sinking Atlantis. So everything that starts from Noah is after Atlantis. Ah, okay, okay. Okay. Absolutely. Now, Maria, in, with regard to the books of Enoch, or the book of Enoch, you say there were originally 30 books, and Noah yes. managed to rescue and take with him seven of those books. Yes. Do those books, con or did those books contain metaphysical knowledge and truths? Okay. okay. I will tell you that all seven books were found in the caves of uh, near Qumran, uh, is that, that where the Dead Sea Scrolls what? were? They recovered. were found in 1947. And what is very interesting is that I read Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, published in 1912. And it was written there about the seven books of Enoch that Noah brought from before the flood. And as you can see, these seven books were found in 1947, 45 years later. Isn't this amazing? Absolutely. And, and they, am I right in saying or thinking that they contain metaphysical truth? I don't know what to say metaphysics. We need to define the term metaphysics because I'm a physicist, okay? And many of the things that were called metaphysics uh, because our physics was not developed enough to explain them, uh, they were mocked and thrown out of physics. However, our physics was developed further, and now we have nonlinear physics in which many of the things that were mocked with the name metaphysics and, and thrown out of physics now have their natural explanation in this new branch of physics, nonlinear physics. And could you give us a couple of examples, okay. Maria? Example, example are the energy vortices and anti vortices of the sun, earth, and man. 
we have the same type of nonlinear electromagnetic field which is organized in absolutely the same way. And it seems like God created everything in his image. Because the sun has vortices and antivortices. And um, they have opposite polarity in the North Hemisphere and the South Hemisphere. And if you cut the sun's sphere into two through the equator, you will have the vortices and the vortices of male and female human energy field. They are the same vortices. They alternate vortices, anti-vortices, vortices, anti-vortices. And in men and women, they are opposite at the same time of day and night. So, uh, scientists know about the vortices and anti-vortices of the sun. And there is no any doubt about this. Uh, nobody questions this because we see them. They are big. However, when we speak about the human vortices and anti-vortices that are so many times weaker, uh, we start to question them. Are they really existing? Um, I have had had equipment developed that allows me to measure them. So I have the proof that they exist. And each of these vortices and anti-vortices energy centers are related with a gland of internal secretion or endocrinal gland. And they really determine the hormonal balance which determines our state of health in our psychological state, because our behavior, patterns of behavior, depend on hormonal balance. And I know in one of your books, and you've written so many, they're fascinating. In one of them, you explain that the pyramids were built uh, with an understanding of the Earth's vortices and anti-vortices. Yep. yep. The pyramids were built on top of magnetic anti-vortices which emit energy. The, uh, the vortices sex energy. They rotate in clockwise direction. The vortices that rotate in counterclock direction, they are called anti-vortices and they emit energy. So uh, the, uh, the, the earth is gradually cooling, and this, this is done through emitting not only heat, but emitting energy. And this energy is emitted from the antivortices. With the pyramids that they built, we know this, that they built the pyramids on top of antivortices, because one of the physicists, Alvarez, went to Egypt with the intent to measure uh, cosmic rays in uh, the pyramids. And he couldn't measure anything, and he had to pack his equipment and come back, because when he unpacked the equipment and plugged it in, uh, the arrows of his instrument were so crazily moving left and right that it was impossible to measure anything. And this is because the pyramids are built on top of magnetic antibodies. And the pyramid itself, the vortex is like, like a funnel, it's like a tornado and root rotate counterclockwise. And in fact, when you have pyramid on the top of it, the pyramid collect the cosmic rays, the cosmic energy, spin it in clockwise direction, and in this way, annihilate the anti -vortex. So the pyramids were built with the practical purpose to decrease the destructive energy of the anti on Earth. 
So they were built to help prevent yes. catas- cataclysmic disasters, natural disasters. We will, we will have. They are built in the equatorial area. There are many pyramids. They are not only in Egypt. There are many pyramids in China. There are pyramids in Bosnia. There are pyramids in Italy. There are pyramids in Central America. And uh, uh, the northern part, that's South America, it, including North America. And um, uh, the purpose is to decrease the destructive energy coming from the Earth. And if these pyramids were not built, we will have a lot more um, earthquakes and volcanoes active. And so Maria, whoever what came I... to Earth was very smart. He built this and made the Earth made the Earth habitable this way. What about the Sphinx, Maria? What's the what does the Sphinx symbolize? Why was that built? What? I was asking. Uh, what about the Sphinx? Uh, why was the, oh, Sphinx the Sphinx built? Yes. Yeah. Okay. The Sphinx was not a Sphinx, according to a metal plate, which is in the Museum of Cairo. The Sphinx used to be a lion, and uh, there is a lot of erosion on the on the body of the Sphinx, and um, the head of the lion was destroyed by a lightning, according to this uh, ancient uh, stone plate. And then Kufu decided to put his head on the top of the lion. And he put a plate in front of the lion, which was now called Sphinx. And if you look at them, you will see that they are from different material, the plate and the head. And they don't have the erosion that the body of the Sphinx has. But if if you think of it, uh, the Sphinx is now in a desert. The fact that there is so much water erosion on the body means that this Sphinx has been there uh, a very, very long time when the climate was different. And the climate was different... Uh, before each big a big ice age, the poles flip at sixty degrees angle, and this brings uh, changes the climate dramatically and brings a lot of extinctions. So this should be built before. Um, the last big ice age. And uh, when they look at the three pyramids in Giza, they look like the belt of Orion, the way it was 10,500 years ago. But considering the erosion, you need to assume that one cycle of precession before this at least one cycle of precession before this, the pyramids and the things have been built, which makes 36,000 years. And Egyptian sources say that uh, these pyramids and the Sphinx complex were there long before the pharaohs very long before. And uh, I have in the book uh, 
number cited that shows that based on their state ancient statements that probably uh, they had been built at least 36,000 years ago. And do, do you believe that there's a connection uh, with the age of the way, Leo? The big ice age, when the poles split at 60 degrees angle, the, the, the climate changes dramatically. That brings a lot of extinctions. Not only this, the earth is flattened at the poles. Imagine what will happen if the poles split at 60 degrees. This happens only during Leo age. The earth needs to be flattened at the new poles that are at 60 degrees and to the old one. This causes so much volcanic and seismic activity, so much ash is emitted in the air that uh, the sun cannot reach the earth's surface and the, uh, the earth becomes frozen in two to three days, they say. They found mammoths in Siberia with still fresh subtropical vegetation in their stomach, which means they didn't have time to digest it. But this means that Siberia once was a subtropical climate, and now it's a frozen land after the last flipping uh, of the poles at 60 degrees 12,500 years ago. And Maria, when, according to your research, will the poles flip again? Obviously, in the next time, the next time we have the age of Leo. Yeah. Uh, yes. The poles will flip at 60 degrees, and we will have big ice age in the next Leo age, and that's why I believe this sculpture of the lion was built as a warning. Mind the Leo age, it is the most destructive. This remains until today the largest sculpture on Earth. It's the next Leo age is going to be 15,000 years from now, so you don't need to worry about this. It's not going to happen during the interview. <laughs> <laughs> well, Marie, I want to ask you again about human humanoids and humanoid species. So we know of folklore about a Bigfoot, for example, and there's a man in Texas who claims that he shot and killed a Bigfoot uh, last year and that he's going to put that on display or uh, going to go on tour with the, the corpse. I think it's quite sad that he would have killed that. But I remember reading in one of your books that you your research shows that there are, I think, I think you said a dozen humanoid species? The total number of humanoid species was 16, according to an ancient source. And um, they have found so far 11. But I think they will continue finding more. There is more to come. And uh, uh, it is not true that they didn't coexist. Unfortunately, before the year 2000, all evidence that they coexisted was thrown away in the garbage can. Uh, after the year 2000, in the year 2001, we had an article in Science that they found in Grand Arena in northern Spain three adjacent caves, and in one lived Homo sapiens, in the other uh, Homo erectus, in the third near, near the Dalles. And they found the proof that there had been communication between them because they found the same instruments in, in different caves, which means that they have been exchanged. And this was the first breakthrough in the new millennium that they coexisted, they didn't evolve one from another. And um, uh, 
It's extremely interesting, Maria. I, I wanted yes. to ask you. And Maria. now, as you can see, with genetic studies, they are finding that um, we have near the our genes. So it was not only the instrument that was exchanged. There, there have been more than this. It's fascinating. Maria, we're going to take a short commercial break and then when okay. we come back I'll be asking you more questions and getting more insight from you. Okay. We'll be back in a moment. A new era in psychic services has begun. PsychicAccess.com You can connect with our psychic advisors by telephone or chat 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. All of our psychic advisors are interviewed, fully verified and accuracy tested, assuring you quality service. We're living in some very troubled times right now. More and more, the world's problems are affecting us on a personal level. You don't have to deal with this alone. Our highly accurate psychics, caring advisors and talented mediums can help with situations you are currently experiencing and can let you know what the future may hold for you. All new customers get a free six-minute reading. All you have to do is register. Why not visit us now and get a free reading at PsychicAccess.com. Welcome back, Maria, after the commercial break. Maria, in all of your research, and I know you've done, you've spent many, many years researching ancient texts and doing your scientific validation, but I want to ask you, um, what, what connections or correlations did you find between, for example, the Bible and, um, oh, I think we've lost Maria for a moment, actually. I think we've lost our connection. Doug's going to get us back. Stephen, are you are you online there? I most definitely am, and I was thinking of asking Maria about the ziggurat, which is another fancy pyramid. All of them. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Well, Maria, sorry we lost you there for a moment, but we're back. And my, my next question for you, Maria, is this one. In all of your research, can you tell us more about what you, what you read in the Bible and your understanding of uh, the things that you, some of the things you've shared with us? The Bible is an ancient source, and I will tell you, uh, the human imagination is not rich enough to create so much factology. So, this is our ancient history, take it or leave it. And uh, there are books like the book of Zenon Kusidovsky, in which on one page it is Bible text, and on the next page it is archaeological finding and proof that what is written in the Bible exists. Existed. And you found connections, Maria, between the Bible and other ancient texts. Can you give us some examples of the other ancient texts? Other ancient texts? There are a lot of ancient texts. But one of the most fascinating texts for me as a scientist are the books of the Hindus. Uh, their ancient astronomy called Surya Siddhanta. And uh, this is the book that I mentioned that what is written in that ancient source when I compare it with study of the glaciers, the difference between the two is 0.3%, which is three times less than 1%, which means that 
these people knew who they were talking about. It's incredible how, in actual fact, over the years... It's incredible, most... and I will tell you that during the Ice Ages, uh, uh, the Ice Ages are called Dark Ages. The human brain, and it is not because only of the cold, it is because our brain activity depends too much. Our, our memory has magnetic origin. And uh, we depend on uh, the magnetic f electromagnetic field of the sun. And uh, during ice ages, there is almost no solar activity, so the magnetic field of the sun is minimum. And that's why you have culture minimum. During each ice age, it, it drops down the civilization to the point that they forget how to write. And then, so, after the Ice Age, they start from zero point. So literally, we lose intelligence and knowledge during these Ice Ages because the, the, we don't have, we, we just don't have that same connection to the sun. Yes. It, that's a, that, you know, I'm an And I have a lot of proof to support this that during the Ice Ages, uh, in Babylon, where was, Babylon was the center of civilization, uh, there were only a few writings about astronomy. And this is just unbelievable, considering that many hundreds were were there uh, when there was no Ice Age. And so can you can you help us understand, Maria, where we are now? So in this at this time, which twenty the beginning of twenty fourteen, where are we in on this spectrum of different ages? Okay. According to study of the glaciers, we are moving to further warming and this is part of the natural cycle. If we have contributed in some way to make this, the rise of the temperature much uh, steeper, uh, we didn't create it, okay? Whatever we have done is in, on the top of natural warming. And when this warming finally finish, we will start moving to the next ice age, according to study of the glaciers. According to the integrations, we are in a period of warming. But the warming, when it reaches a maximum, will be followed by the next ice age. How about life on other planets, Maria? Do you believe that there is life on other planets out there? Of course. It will be uh, too narrow-minded to think that we are the only species in the universe. All the more that the Hubble telescope is discovering more and more planets orbiting stars. So, I can tell you as a physicist and scientist that life can, can be expected on planets that have electromagnetic field because ele electromagnetic field will allow, will be catching the ions from the solar wind. That's what our Earth magnetic field is doing, and that's why we have the ionosphere. And this ionosphere is protecting cold from our, for our Earth. Without this protecting cold, without the magnetic field that catches these ions and the ions protect us, without the magnetic field, the solar wind uh, will blow all the atmosphere and the Earth will be that planet. 
And if you look at the planet Mars, it is an old, cold, and dead planet. There is no atmosphere. And it is absolute illusion to think about that we can go to Mars, create atmosphere, and live there. You cannot. If you create atmosphere, the solar wind will blow it out. Blow it away. Blow it away. I remember, Maria, that in one of your books, I think I'm right in saying that you you felt that Mars, in fact, isn't doesn't originate in our solar system. What what about the solar system? I I remember re in re reading one of your books. Yeah. That there was one planet that you felt originated from elsewhere. In other words, it didn't naturally belong in our solar system. Was that Mars? Yeah, it's Mars. Because it does not have liquid core. It is much, much older. According to the magnetic studies of Mario Acuna, uh, who dated lava or melted rocks. When they solidify, they register the magnetic field. So they found in the southern half of Mars, in the southern hemisphere of Mars, two craters, huge craters from huge meteors. And they didn't find any magnetic uh, properties in the rocks that were melted by the meteors, which means that these meteors hit Mars uh, when Mars was a dead planet with no magnetic field. And according to calculations of Mario Kuna, this happened four million years ago. Four billion years ago. And because our Earth is 4.32 billion years, this means that Mars didn't originally belong to our solar system. And uh, there are uh, ancient sources that say this, and one of them is the Siddhanta of the Hindus, the ancient astronomy of the Hindus. Maria, I was reading about the Anunnaki, these giants that apparently lived or live somehow on our planet. What can you tell us about the Anunnaki and aliens or other other civilizations visiting our planet in the past? Wow. <laughs> uh, the, in the Bible it is written, and in many other ancient sources it is written, that... Uh, the planet was visited by sons of gods which made it with earthly, uh, who made it with earthly women. And the offspring of this mating were the giants. So, uh, in the Bible there is quite a bit of information about the giants. And, um, they found, I have this in one of my books, they found on the territory of Israel, uh, they excavated bones of a giant. So, uh, of course, this was immediately uh, pronounced hoax. But uh, I, I truly believe that the giants were the offspring of this sons of God that made it to ugly women. So you do believe that the Anunnaki walked our planet? Mm hmm Yes. And and they they but they would not be would you say they were one of the I think you and, said sixteen and, and or eighteen way, species. Uh, the Hindu ancient astronomy, uh, Surya Sikranta says that this is the astronomy of the demigods who were our fathers. So this is another source that say what the Bible says.
that they were demigods? They were called gods because they were very advanced in knowledge and technology. They were called demigods, almost gods. And they were worshipped as gods. I know that... Including whatever they brought to planet Earth, it was considered holy. I know, Maria, that you, when you, when you wrote about Noah and the, the descendants, descendants of Noah scattering in all directions to Egypt, Mesopotamia, Middle Asia, etc., bringing yes. advanced knowledge, you then looked at languages and the similarities or connections between the, the linguistic roots. Could you yes. tell us a little about that and how that 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 demonstrates that, yes, uh, that Noah this demonstrates that we have common origin, you know. In many ancient languages, Aramaic, Hebrew, Sanskrit, Toharian, uh, Sumerian, Gaelic, you have the same word kuman, which means spiritual man. My family name is Kuman, so I had to dig out what it means. It means spiritual man in all ancient languages. In uh, Hebrew, when they worship God, they will kneel and get up. Kneeling was Kiwi, get up was Kum. And from here came Kum as somebody who is spiritually up. And two nations still speak Sanskrit. Uh, The Lithuanian language is Sanskrit. Like. And the Koreans have a lot of Sanskrit words. Both these nations have the name Kum and the meaning is spiritual. And I was amazed to find out that these ancient languages which we consider extinct, you know, they still have a representation here and there and there are nations that are still speaking them. And I think that uh, the Welsh language, Kimrik, is the language of the Kimerians, and this was when the local Black Sea flood scattered the people all over the planet Earth, and it was 7,000 years ago. So, Kimrik is 7,000 years old. This is the oldest language still spoken. And I spoke with Welsh people, and they said, unfortunately, uh, the language will not exist much longer because the new generation does not speak Welsh, and the old generation is dying. Another representation of the Sumerian language is the Lithuanians, they speak Sanskrit, sorry, not Sumerian. Oh, Maria, so, we can see the Sanskrit, that language, but Lithuanians are still speaking Sanskrit. <laughs> yes, well, Maria, we only have a couple of minutes left, but I have to ask you this last question because this fascinates me. What is the connection between the Celts and the Native American Indians? <laughs> I have uh-huh. a, whole, a whole book written about this. Celts in America before Columbus, the origin yes. of the Native Americans. I found tribes that came from Asia. I found the same conglomerate of tribes in Asia, and I found the same conglomerate of tribes here in uh, North America. And they, when they ca- came through the Bering Strait, they came during Ice Age. They could walk between the two continents. Uh, they settled around the um, Great Lakes, and they were Celtic tribes, the so-called Celts. They were called Tohari when they lived in Asia. 
when they started moving to Europe, they were called Kelpi, which in Greek means strangers, and the Romans called them Gali, which in Latin means strangers. They lived in Middle Asia for 5,000 years, so nobody remembered who these people were. And they were the Celts, and the Celts were a mixture of many, many tribes. And uh, the tribes that live around the American Indian, so-called American Indian tribes that live around the Great Lakes were uh, Dakota, who were probably descendants of the Daki, which were Aryan tribe, and uh, Iroquois probably came after the collapse of the, of the entire of Irnik at 600 AD. So they came to America 1,000 years before the settlers came. And that's why they were called Native Americans. There's no such thing like Native Americans. They all came at different times from different parts of planet Earth. And uh, the Cherokee are the southern branch of the Iroquois. So the Cherokees are Celtic type too. Well, That's Maria, why you, you see a lot of the settlers that came 1,000 years after these Celtic tribes came. They intermarried. They intermarried because we have this feature. We are attracted to people that look like us. Can you see? The settlers were attracted to the Cherokees because they look kind of like them. Because they were genetically connected. If you go far enough, you will find this. Maria, this has been fascinating, and I could ask you questions forever, but we've come to the end of our time, and I, I want to thank you for joining us and for sharing your many years, or just, a, just some of your um, knowledge from your many years of research and scientific validation. Thank you for joining us. Don't miss... <laughs> <laughs> Don't... Uh think that I'm Romanian because I will get offended. <laughs> no, I know, I know, I know you're not from Romania. But I, you've, you've got amazing knowledge, Maria, and I, I'm really grateful for you taking the time to join us, particularly when you're not feeling well. Okay. Thank you very much for having me. I highly appreciate this. Wonderful. Well, we appreciate you, and thank you so much. We'll definitely want you back to share more thank with you. us someday. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Bye. Bye. Hello, my name is Res Miranda. If you're having relationship, career, or life issues, I'm inviting you to experience what it's like to have access to professional, highly accurate psychics and spiritual advisors you can trust to care and help you. Register now to get your free six minute reading by telephone or chat. Get answers, get access, psychic access, 24 hours a day, seven days a week psychicaccess.com